Enter the world of forensic science, the science of crime, where a suspect's guilt or innocence can hang on a single piece of evidence. How much does science really know about sleep or dreaming? Or how they intersect with our waking world? Exhibit A, the mystery of sleep. The last thing John Greer remembered was falling asleep watching Saturday Night Live. Then he had these weird flashes. He's mother-in-law with a help me look on her face. Yelling kids, kids, trying to warn them about something. The sound of a phone beeping off the hook. Then coming awake in his car and seeing a bloody knife beside him. If this was a nightmare, he desperately wanted to wake up. Then the horror dawned on him. He drove to the nearest police station where he blurted out, oh my God, I think I just killed two people. The police sped to his in-laws. They found John's father-in-law still alive with serious knife wounds to his back and head. His mother-in-law had been stabbed five times and hit with a tire iron. An hour later, John's wife, Lisa, is awakened by two police officers. They break the news that her mother has been murdered and that her husband is the murderer. It doesn't make any sense to her. In the six years she'd known John, he never once showed any violent tendencies. They had met in high school. She was a rebellious teenager, and he encouraged her to reconcile with her folks, especially her mother. To John, Lisa's parents were like the Brady Bunch, the family he always wished he had. And he'd always been particularly close to her mother. It just didn't make any sense. When Lisa finally brings herself to visit John in jail, she expects answers. Why did he attack them? Why did he drive 20 minutes in the middle of the night to her parents' home? What happened? John can't answer any of it. Even his severely damaged hands are a mystery. Lisa leaves angry and confused. From this point on, there would always be two juries judging John the one in the courtroom, and the one in his wife's heart. He resigned himself to this inevitable fate, a divorce from Lisa and a conviction for first-degree murder. The attack didn't sound like something John would do, not to John's grandmother. So she hired John, one of the best criminal lawyers in the country, Marlis Edward. He was deeply uh, sad, uh, tearful, and he was very clear that he did not remember, uh, he did not understand what had happened, he did not know if he was responsible for the death of his mother-in-law and the you know, severe stabbing of him and wounding of his father-in-law. Uh, so really all he could say in the most compelling of ways was I'm confused, I'm frightened, I, I don't know why I'm here, I've damaged my hands, I've, you know, his hands were very badly injured by obviously handling a knife of some kind, uh, and I don't know what happened. 
Why was his memory so sketchy about such a horrendous attack? Was he faking? Or was it some form of temporary insanity? She called Ronald Billings, an expert in forensic psychiatry. I was puzzled because he was, he was depressed, but he was depressed because of what happened. There was no evidence of any kind of delusional thinking, and he didn't have a long history of antisocial behavior, and he was not an aggressive person. Um, his nickname was the Gentle Giant. Uh, so there's really, there was nothing. There was nothing. He didn't show the, there was no personality disorder. He wasn't psychopath. Um, it was just a puzzle. Meanwhile, the police had a strong case. His father-in-law could identify John as the attacker. They had also found the murder weapon in John's car. And they had his confession when he entered the police station. Then what would explain the attack? I looked to some external uh, circumstances that would give clues. And one of them is the absence of any motive. I mean, there was no insurance policy, there was no money, there's no anger, uh, and you can't find a reason. And we, we found, I think, a clue, and a very important clue that started to move us in direction of, exp of exploring sleep disorders. When we received from the Crown a copy of his statement to the police, in our law, uh, we provide for, and it's rarely been successful, a defense of non-insane automatism. Sleepwalking is one variety of that. Sleepwalking. Many of her colleagues found it far-fetched. Others, ridiculous. A jury would never believe it. Nobody would. Would you? Marlis Edward wanted to know as much as she could about sleepwalking. Searching for an expert, she found one close to home, Roger Broughton. Marlis got permission for Broughton to set up a temporary sleep lab in a parole office. Technicians would monitor John's brain waves, eye movements, muscle tone, and blood oxygen. There are two uh, qualitatively different uh, types of sleep. Uh, the first type we refer to usually as non-REM sleep or synchronized sleep or sometimes quiet sleep. And the other type uh, we refer to as rapid eye movement sleep or REM sleep, also called paradoxical sleep and, and active sleep. Uh, there are significant differences uh, between these two types of sleep, which are really as different from each other as either is from wakefulness. Sleepwalking occurs in deep sleep, the lowest of the four levels of non-REM sleep. Uh, in, in normal subjects, when we study their sleep, they very rarely go from the deepest stages of non-REM sleep, what we've called slow-wave sleep, to wakefulness. It's quite rare. Dr. Broughton observes John Greer immediately sinks down to level four, deep sleep, then suddenly shifts to wakefulness without passing through any of the other three levels. One or two such shifts per night is usual. Here in this uh, first study, uh, he had, I think it was four or five, one, two, uh, three, uh, four, so four here. So this is fairly characteristic of sleepwalkers. Experts believe sleepwalking is an incomplete arousal from sleep. The person has their eyes open, but they're like a robot, carrying out some deeply embedded internal program. That's why sleepwalking is often made up of familiar actions. There was a man who used to cook entire meals while asleep. He would grunt like an animal at these times, and his family learned not to wake him because he would become aggressive. In the morning, the man could never remember any of it. Not only was the man a sleepwalker, but his children and grandchildren had a high incidence of sleepwalking. In fact, when his grandson was six, he tried to climb out a sixth floor window in his sleep. The sleepwalking cook was John's maternal grandfather. 
The grandson who tried to climb out the sixth floor window was none other than John Greer himself. He also had other sleep dis disorders which frequently cluster with sleepwalking, which include uh, sleep terrors, of which he had had in the past, uh, sleep talking to a certain extent, and a pattern of very deep sleep. So personal circumstances and family history are two of the preconditions of sleepwalking. Others are stress and exhaustion. To understand how these might have had an influence on John, defense scrutinized the days leading up to the murder. John and Lisa had married in their teens. Within two years, they'd saved enough to buy a car and put a down payment on a house. Life was great. Then one weekend, they went with another couple to the Queen's Plate. John's horse won and paid $45. John thought he had the knack. He knew Lisa dreamed of going to Australia. He thought he'd play the horses just until he won enough to send her there. Within a year, his dream became a nightmare. He started losing, then stealing small amounts from his employer to cover his losses. In time, he embezzled $32,000 and was caught, fired, and charged with theft. He spent a night in jail. Lisa and her folks stuck by him. No one would hire him. With Lisa pregnant with their first child and to stem her financial anxieties, he lied that he had gotten a job. Then he started playing the horses again believing somehow that he could win enough to repay his employer and bail himself out of trouble. This time, when he started losing, he borrowed from loan sharks and stole from his wife's bank account. The murder had taken place on Saturday night. The pressure began building that Thursday. That's when Lisa was notified that one of her checks had bounced. Assuming it was a mistake, she inquired at the bank. They showed her a stack of checks with her signature. With a sickening feeling, she realized they'd been forged by John. That night, she screamed at John and banished him from their bedroom. He couldn't sleep that night. Then on Friday, Lisa discovered he'd been lying about having a job and that they were more in debt than she'd imagined. She had never been so angry. Alone, he couldn't stop worrying that she'd leave and take their new baby. And he couldn't blame her. He couldn't sleep that night either. On Saturday, after being awake 48 straight hours, he played rugby, hoping it would make him tired enough to fall asleep. When Lisa came home from work, he expected she would demand a divorce. Instead, she told him they'd sell the house, repay his employer, and start all over again. John couldn't believe it. He would have to come clean with her parents. That would be one of the hardest things he'd ever have to do. He feared he'd lose their love and respect. But if that was the price of keeping his marriage together, he'd do it. That night, Lisa asked him if he was coming upstairs to bed. He said he'd sleep downstairs until all of this was behind him. As he settled down to watch the end of Saturday Night Live, he believed they'd weathered the storm. But if life up until now had been a nightmare, it was to become a living hell. When John Greer fell asleep that night, he'd been awake for 60 hours, 60 hours reliving the awful events of the past three days. 
60 bleary hours of agonizing stress. So yes, on the night of the murder, John Greer was a prime candidate for sleepwalking. But would a jury believe it? Would they believe that he had driven 20 minutes on a superhighway and committed two ghastly attacks while sleepwalking? Exhibit A, to sleep, for chance to sleepwalk. The judge in this case had three questions for the jury to decide. Did John Greer cause the death of his mother-in-law? And if he did, were the acts causing the death conscious and voluntary? And if the acts were not conscious and voluntary, what crime was committed? We knew we had to put forward a thorough and exhaustive case, one that would convince a rational person so that, you know, they wouldn't walk away saying, this is ridiculous, this is incredible. It had to be, you know, enough evidence that 12 ordinary people in the community would look at it and say, this is the only explanation. John's final thoughts before falling asleep that fateful Saturday night might have been filled with anxiety about meeting the next day with his in-laws. Deep in sleep, an hour or two later, which is when most sleepwalking occurs, he might have started acting out the next day's events. How else to explain why he left the house without socks or underwear? The first time he'd ever done that. Or why he'd left the front door wide open? Another thing he'd never done before. Then he started driving on a super highway to his in-laws, a route he'd driven hundreds of times. Is driving a more complex action than John's grandfather's cooking entire meals? No one could be absolutely positive about the next events. How John got in is not clear. One could imagine his mother-in-law seeing him at four in the morning and trying to figure out what was going on. Perhaps, as happens with sleepwalkers, she'd physically tried to get his attention and he became aggressive. Terrified, she might have run into the kitchen and tried the phone, which didn't work because the extension had been knocked off the hook. Perhaps that's when she reached for the knife. John's father-in-law testified that he woke up with John choking him. He hadn't remembered John saying anything before he blacked out. Perhaps that's when John's mother-in-law returned and John had taken the knife from her, blade first, which is how his hands got cut to the bone. Perhaps that's when he had his flash of her face with the help me expression before he attacked her with the knife. Around that time, one of the girls came out onto the landing and called out to see what was going on. The girls testified they heard grunting. John's grandfather used to grunt when he cooked in his sleep. Then he remembered coming awake and seeing the bloody knife next to him. More time had elapsed since he'd left the house than most sleepwalking incidents. Then there was his confusion at the police station when he blurted out, my God, I've just killed two people with my hands. Then he added, I killed them. I don't know why. By the time Marlis Edward presented her case in court, four other psychiatrists testified that John Greer was sleepwalking when he stabbed his mother-in-law to death. In an emotional victory, Lisa finally believed but even if he was sleepwalking, was he still guilty of first-degree murder? Had he programmed himself while awake to kill his mother-in-law in his sleep? There's no evidence that one can create a motivation uh, in wakefulness uh, as a sleepwalker uh, in a way that would um, carry over 
in, in sleepwalking. Marlis Edward argued that yes, John Greer had caused his mother-in-law's death, but that neither a first or second degree murder or manslaughter charge applied. Since the prosecution had failed to present beyond a reasonable doubt that John's actions were voluntary and conscious. The jury deliberated for nine hours. When the judge asked, members of the jury, have you agreed upon your verdict? The jury foreman stood up and replied, we find him not guilty. Greer was free. I was committed to a person who I believed if, if he had been convicted, um, would have been wrongly convicted. And that in itself, is the real benefit and the real joy of doing criminal defense work when you think you get the right result and the just result. He and Lisa tried to put their shattered lives back together again. But after a few years, they filed for divorce. As far as is known, John Greer had never again acted violently in his sleep. Was it a freak of nature? A one in a billion occurrence? I, I think we're all uncomfortable with the idea that, uh, that we or another person could have complex behavior uh, of which we're unaware and w which is out of our or the person's control. We tend to think if we understand something, it's no longer a mystery. But with sleep and its disorders, the more we understand, the more mysterious it becomes. The stories in Exhibit A are based on actual cases. The names of the victims have been changed to protect their identities. The names of the guilty are real.